Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, April 18th, 2023 business meeting of the Olympia City Council. For the record, uh, we have a quorum. All council members are present. Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, receive a motion to approve tonight's agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We have an agenda. Takes us to special recognition. We have three items this evening. We're going to start off with item 2A, which is a proclamation that we'll be reading that recognizes Earth Month, not just day. Uh, and so at this time, I'd like to invite forward uh, Dr. Pamela Braff, our um, Director of Climate Programs, uh, to talk a little bit about... Oh, I did it backwards. I, I didn't follow my arrow. Sorry. I moved the proclamation up. So you're right. I was wrong. Sorry. <laughs> we are going to start by reading the proclamation, and then we'll be inviting up Dr. Oh, Kadok. So I think I'm starting to my right. Whereas Earth Day was created 53 years ago, recognizing the importance for everyone to participate in preserving our natural resources, and that first, and that the first Earth Day on that on the first Earth Day, 20 million Americans rally for a healthy, sustainable environment, and. Whereas the global community now faces extraordinary challenges, such as global health issues, food and water shortages, and economic struggles, and whereas all life forms on Earth have a right to a healthy, sustainable environment, and... Whereas Jay Inslee, the governor of Washington State, has proclaimed the month of April to be Earth Month in Washington State in recognition of the urgency of enlisting all people to protect and sustain life on the planet, and whereas Olympia has followed suit and declared an entire Earth Month and urges others to do the same, and... Whereas the procession of the species was created in 1995 to commemorate, commemorate the 25th anniversary of Earth Day and to support congressional renewal of the Endangered Species Act, inspiring thousands of young and old to deepen their understanding, appreciation, and protection of the natural world, and... Whereas all of us as caretakers of our planet have an obligation to change the human behaviors that contribute to climate change and environmental degradation to preserve the Earth's beauty as well as its resources and. Whereas our local residents, schools, environmental organizations, and businesses have raised over 100 Earth flags to unite those during the entire month working on in the interests of the planet and to build intergenerational action through local activism and global environmental consciousness and... Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Olympia City Council does hereby proclaim April as Earth Month, signed in the city of Olympia, Washington, this 18th day of April 2023, Olympia City Council, Cheryl Selby, Mayor. And now I'd like to invite forward Dr. Braff. Thank you, Mayor Felton, members of council, uh, for this Earth Day recognition proclamation. I just wanted to share a couple of announcements with you all of some fun activities going on uh, this weekend and this month in honor of Earth Day and Earth Month. Um, first, Olympia Parks is partnering with the Park Foundation of Thurston County and the local Lions Club to host their annual Earth Day Stewardship event at Squawkson Park on Saturday, April 22nd from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. During the event, volunteers will help remove English ivy and plant an Earth Day tree in the location that they've restored. I believe more than 70 volunteers have already reg registered for the event, and there's still room for more people to come and show up. Um, and also, on the same day, Stream Team will be hosting an Earth Day celebration right after the, the, the parks event, honoring their Stream Team volunteers and also celebrating Michelle Stevie's retirement from 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, Inner City Transit is hosting their Earth Day Market Ride, also on April 22nd. Neighborhood riders can meet up at the Heritage Park Foundation at 10.30 a.m. for the group bike to the Olympia Farmers Market. And this is also the kickoff for their annual Bicycle Community Challenge that's going to start in May. I hear that there is going to be free coffee and bakery treats for folks who want to participate. Um, and you may have also noticed there's an art installation in the front windows of City Hall right now. Um, this is the Disappearing Kelp Forest. It was made up from by some students at the Olympia Regional Learning Academy. Um, it's on display right now to celebrate Earth Day, and it's going to be up through, art, through the weekend of Arts Walk. 
Um, and I also wanted to share that you can come visit the climate team at either the farmer's market or the Earth Day event at the park this weekend. Uh, we're gonna be there sharing information about our recently launched Energize Olympia campaign. So we'll be handing out some information and be talking to community members about what we're working on there. Um, so that's what's going on for Earth Day. Um, and I also have another kind of multi-part fun announcement to share with everyone, which is that we have welcomed some new climate staff. So I'm gonna invite uh, Hannah and Ali to come up and join us, and we'll just do quick introductions. So I just wanted to start by thanking Council for your investment in the climate program. Having additional staff makes a world of a difference in our ability to implement the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan, develop new programs, resources, policies, the things that we need here in Olympia to achieve our climate goals. And so Hannah and Ali are helping us to do that. Um, first, I want to introduce Hannah Jungren, who is a climate program specialist who started just last month. Hello, as Pamela just said, my name is Hannah Jungren, and I just started with the city last month. I most recently am coming from Bainbridge Island, where I was their climate action outreach coordinator. Uh, prior to that, though, I actually came from Tacoma area. Um, I graduated from Pacific Lutheran University there and got my degree in environmental studies. And I've had the opportunity to work in various organizations throughout Washington, working on a variety of environmental topics. And I'm very excited to be back on this side of the state and being able to further continue my work. We're very excited to have Hannah on board. Uh, she's already been doing a lot of great work to kick off some of our outreach events that we're running right now. Um, and then also Ali Bailey, who is not exactly a new face around the city. Um, Ali is a Civic Spark AmeriCorps fellow who actually started her service here at the city um, this past September. And so we won't have her forever, unfortunately. Her, her, her term ends in August, but she's been doing a lot of great work and I'm gonna let her say a few words as well. Hello, uh, as Dr. Braff said, my name is Allie Bailey. I'm a Civic Spark AmeriCorps fellow with the climate program. Um, before this, I graduated from Evergreen State College in June, this last June, with a Bachelor of Science and Arts. My last quarter there, I actually was an intern with the climate program, which is how I started working with the city through the Center for Climate Action and Sustainability at Evergreen. And during that internship, uh, working with Dr. Braff, I spent the 10 weeks making an inventory of buildings in the city of Olympia. And when the opportunity came up for this fellowship, I was really excited to apply for it because working with the city has been a great experience. And it's really exciting to be a part of the climate program as it's getting started and implementing all these projects and plans. Right now, I'm researching strategies for decarbonizing existing buildings. I'm also revisiting the building stock inventory I created last year and acting as outreach and education lead for the Energize Olympia campaign. And after the service year is over, I'm going to Western Washington University for a master's degree in environmental science. And I hope to further these interests that I've kind of developed working in climate by researching potential climate change impacts on water quality in Lake Whatcom. Um, my experience at the city and with Civic Spark has really helped me attain those goals and affirm those passions for climate work and public service. And as, as was mentioned, I'll only be here till August, but I'm really, really excited for the next few months and to see how Olympia's climate related projects keep growing after that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, um, thanks for all of your work. I know, uh, coming to us as a fellow is, uh, always kind of an unknown period of time for, for the city and for the for the fellow. So I'm glad that you're enjoying your time and welcome aboard. Uh, it's so nice to meet you, Hannah. And uh, yeah, it's just I'm glad that Pamela now has a, a lot more support that she that she needs. And, um, you know, because I know we we take on a lot for our whole county in this area. So any other comments? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now we're on to item 2B, which is uh, Proclamation 
recognizing the 50th anniversary of the Friends of the Olympia Library. Uh, so I have uh, Mayor Pro Tem Gilman is going to be reading the proclamation, and then we'll I'll invite forward a representative from the Friends. Whereas the Friends of the Olympia Library was established in 1973 in the belief that excellent library service is important and adds to the quality of life in the community, and whereas the City of Olympia recognizes the tremendous impact the Friends of the Olympia Library has made in our community through their mission to support, promote, and augment the operations of the Olympia Library. And whereas the City of Olympia acknowledges that countless classrooms, families, and individuals have had the books they need due to the diligent and consistent volunteer work of the Friends of the Olympia Library. And whereas Olympia as a community has benefited from the dozens of programs across many interests, which have all been made possible through the work of the Friends of the Olympia Library. And whereas the City of Olympia understands that despite challenges and changes, the Friends of the Olympia Library have rallied and maintained their focus and grew their goals to provide community programming and well-stocked shelves for the local libraries. And whereas April marks the 50th anniversary of the Friends of the Olympia Library organization, and whereas the City of Olympia encourages the community to visit the Friends of the Olympia Library's historic and informational display at the downtown Olympia Library, now, therefore, be it proclaimed that in honor of their 50th anniversary, the City of Olympia declares Tuesday, April 18th, 2023, as Friends of the Olympia Library Day in the City of Olympia, and urges the community to visit the downtown Olympia Timberland Library and the other branches to show your appreciation <laughs> and support for the integral role they play in our community, signed in Olympia this 18th day of April for the Olympia City Council, Cheryl Selby, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Gilman. And at this time, I'd like to invite forward Jan Hopler, who is the president, I believe, of the group. Thank you, Inmeta Selby and Council Member Gilman and all the rest of the council for this making today the Friends of the Olympia Library Day. I thank you on behalf of all of the people who have contributed to Friends over 50 years. That's kind of awesome. 50 years worth of donating time, money, and books to um, the Friends of the Library So, and the books mostly so we can sell them and earn money to support programming um, at the library. We think that strong libraries are important, essential in fact, for strong communities and are happy for the opportunity to work toward a stronger um, community of Olympia. And so I would like to make just a small pitch that the next time you're looking at the books in your homes or offices and think, oh, I should get rid of a few of those, that you think of us because we will um, do good things with the books and with the money we can raise through them. Thank you for the proclamation. Um, we will be posting it at the library so others can see it. Wonderful. Let me... I Give this a little signature here, Jan, and there might be some questions for you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, any comments regarding the uh, Mayor Pro Tem followed by Council Member Huen, Council Member Parshley. Good, well, I just, I, first, I mean, I'm just such a fan of a place that makes it possible for people to have a ticket anywhere by reading, and it's, it's sort of the station where you, where you get, get that. But more specifically to the friends, you've created opportunities for me to dress up like Dumbledore and read a story, to play my ukulele and sing Christmas songs. Um, <laughs> The, the, and to attend many other people's special events. And I, I really appreciate what you've done to enrich the community through the programming that you've created. If, and if I may, I have a question. And that is the library has fewer and fewer print books. So you're still you know, collecting books and selling books. 
how how will the friends respond to more and more digital media and the the changing of the library? We're responding so far in a couple of different ways. One is that we also accept and sell DVDs um, and CDs, not the older media in tapes, because we can't sell those. Um, our support for the library has included in the last year buying um, DVD players that people can check out and take home and watch DVDs and then bring back. Um, I'm not sure of the other. We help with a number of subscriptions that advertise a number of different media, so that is another way as well. All right, Councilmember Huynh. You can't top Dumbledore and the ukulele. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, I just think it's great whenever uh, there's an opportunity for uh, organizations to be recognized, but to also um, take this time to let us know, or really the broader community that may be sitting here in the stands or uh, viewing, um, what are some volunteer opportunities or, or, or ways of giving? Um, certainly there is getting a membership, um, and uh, that's pretty low cost, but then also other ways to support the, the Friends of the Olympia Library. And so um, if you'd take a moment and share some of those. Sure. Um, you're right. Um, becoming a member is can be low cost. It's as little as um, $10 a year. There are, you know, kind of super friends and you could uh, contribute more. We also um, need volunteers to help us manage the flow of books and media. So people bring donations and we sort those and put the um, those that are in the best condition on shelves to be sold at the library. And that takes a certain amount of people power to accept the books, to sort the books, to put them out. Um, we also have the usual um, activities an organization has about memberships and volunteers and um, organizing announcements and newsletters. So the best way to um, let us know you're interested, well, the actual best way is to come into the library. But uh, what is also available is um, on our website, which is Olympia Oli Friends, no, sorry, OliLibraryFriends.com. Um, you can indicate interest. We will contact you. You can um, join the organization. You can say how it is you uh, think you'd like to help. Great. Thank you. Good question. Uh, next, I have Councilmember Partially. Um, first, books are magic. They can take you places that even without getting in your car or an airplane. I learned that late in life being dyslexic and not actually learning to read until I was in fourth grade. And books became my friend. So thank you for being here. But my real question is, if you had a lot of books... Where would you take them? Is it on the web? Is it, how would we get them to you? Uh, you bring them um, to the library. To the library. If you have a few, you can bring them anytime. There's a bin near the shelves where we sell books. Um, if you have a substantial number of books, we ask that you come on Wednesdays or Saturday from noon to 2 because there are volunteers on site at that point that can help you move them into the library and receive them and move them into our sorting area um, in that that's something the library staff can't help with. So we're there to help you do that those times. If you really had a lot, you could let us know on the website or come into the library and leave a note in the um, box we have for money to pay for the books, but say I have a lot and we would contact you and figure out what would be the best way to process that. All right. I knew we'd have lots of questions. I knew. So this is great. Appreciate all the interest. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next we have item 2C, which is actually a resolution that we're going to read and then take action on the resolution. Uh, so we're going to start with that uh, th that reading, and I believe that I will be kicking it off tonight. So uh, this is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Olympia, Washington, honoring Olympia Firehouse 5 and its members with the City of Olympia Fire Department's Station 5 designation. Uh, 
I apologize for my technical difficulty. Whereas Olympia Firehouse Five is a nonprofit corporation created on Feb February 1st, 1998, as an organization of and representing retired members of the Olympia Fire Department. And whereas the membership of Olympia Firehouse Five is made up of mostly retired Olympia firefighters who are carrying on the traditions and history of the Olympia Fire Department and. Whereas, Olympia Firehouse 5 has a physical location that serves as a historic preservation museum for antique fire engines, equipment, and memorabilia, and whereas, Olympia Firehouse 5 provides a second home for current and retired members, along with their families, to receive and provide support, exchange ideas, and nurture the spirit, and... Whereas, Olympia Firehouse 5 continues its service to the community by showcasing the, its antique fire engines, sharing space with the community, and providing historical knowledge of the fire service and its culture, and... Whereas, the City of Olympia Council recognizes and appreciates the value of Olympia Firehouse 5 and its members now and into the future, and whereas... The City of Olympia wishes to honor and recognize Olympia Firehouses 5's place in Olympia Fire Department's legacy by foregoing any future use of the name Station 5. And? Whereas this, when the City of Olympia builds a new fire station, the station will be designated Station 6. Now, therefore, the Olympia City Council does hereby resolve as follows. Olympia Firehouse 5 is recognized and appreciated for its contributions to the Olympia community and... In honor of Olympia Firehouse 5 and all retired members of the Olympia Fire Department, the designation sta Station 5 is to be reserved and used to refer to Olympia Firehouse 5 and retired members of the Olympia Fire Department and... A future fire station, which would have been designated Station 5, is to be designated Station 6. The city manager and the Olympia Fire Department shall so designate a future fire station. All right, and I'm not going to read the last part because it uh, states what our motion is in our, um, our voting record. So we are going to hold off on that until we have a motion. I'll go ahead and read it. Um, oh, wait, no. Councilmember Huen, do you have the motion? Yes. Um, uh, I move to approve the resolution honoring Olympia Firehouse 5 and its members with the City of Olympia Fire Department Station um, 05 designation. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. And now... So you'll be getting, uh, or the resolution will be entered into the record at the city as having been passed by the Olympia City Council this uh, 18th day of April, 2023. So with that, I'd like to invite forward, uh, I've got Mike Simmons here and I believe Ray McDonald. Did Ray? So anyway, thank you again for having us here. We would have had more of our Firehouse 5 members here if the meeting was a little bit earlier. But at the retirement home, the dinner bell is at 5 o'clock, and they're not missing that for nothing. So, but, yeah. Anyway, so like I said, we're honored to receive this. This really means a lot to us, the retired guys. So I just got a little something I'd like to say. It's like, uh, uh, you know, on behalf of the retired firefighters and members of Firehouse 5, we would like to thank Council Member Huynh for pursuing this resolution and the City Council, the City Manager and the Fire Chief for agreeing to the terms of, the, of this resolution. When a firefighter spends more than half their life dedicated to protecting and serving the community and creating a fantastic fire department, it's hard for most of us to hang up our gear, retire, and just walk away. Fire, um, at Station 5, we consist of brother and sister firefighters, fire officers, and chiefs who have worked hard to make Olympia Fire Department a great and safe place to work and something to be proud of. In 1998, the fire chief at the time, Larry Dibble, began a simple little tradition that when a firefighter retired, he presented them with a shirt and a badge with the logo Station 5 printed on it. When you retire, you're inducted into Station 5. 
At the time, we only had three stations in the city of Olympia, and we never thought we'd grow bigger, you know, seeing more than four. I guess we were kind of wrong. Um, although, at the time, Station 5 was fictitious, it was still considered part of the organization. Once a member, always a member. Retired members would meet at local coffee shops weekly, usually at a location that had the cheapest coffee, uh, to talk about the past, good things, the great saves, the jokes we would play on each other, and try to, re and try to forget about the, all the bad things we'd seen and experienced. As firefighters, we had a purpose, a good one. And then next day, you wake up, you're retired, now what? <clears throat> well, thanks to retired Olympia firefighter Ray McDonald and his wife Renee, these two purchased a piece of property with this huge, beautiful shop that we now call Station 5. Our primary mission is to preserve Olympia's firefighter in history uh, by maintaining and restoring antique fire engines and equipment. We have created basically a firehouse museum that is home to Olympia, Olympia's original engines 2, 3, 4, 7, and 9, and also Telmar's first original engine 1. Uh, we're also a nonprofit, and we assist in charitable events to raise money for other nonprofits by offering engine rides and parades, fire engine visits, photos with Santa. Uh, we call a thing called the trunk or treat. Any, you know, anything that somebody has, we're there, we'll do it. Um, all you got to do is give us a call. Um, <clears throat> I don't uh, think, well, actually, I know Station 5 was not Ray and Renee's original plan, but it took off, and it keeps getting bigger. Today, we not only represent retired and active firefighters from Olympia, but we have welcomed in 141 active, re, active and retired firefighters representing 21 departments. And we go now we have one member that's actually was uh, FDNY. Uh, so it's just kind of a thing. Everybody's kind of reaching out. It's doing kind of good. And besides firefighters, we stepped out. We, re, we currently have a retired doctor and a retired teacher, teacher who are amazing mechanics. So they do a lot of work for us on our fire engines. And we've also included a retired lieutenant state patrolman. So you know we're open to everybody. <laughs> and again, you know, so really, again, uh, I just want to thank you for y your consideration in doing this, for thinking of us, and we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Well put, well put. And Ray, did you want to say something? Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, no, thank you. Uh, it sounds like you, have I've not been able to visit yet, but I'm looking forward to being retired here in nine months. And <laughs> so maybe you'll accept old mayors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's see you down there. Anybody have any questions or anything? Uh, Councilmember Drone. Oh, I'm sorry. I was supposed to go to Councilmember Wynn first. I am like off my marks all <laughs> all the time here. So yeah, you're not retired yet. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I just uh, real quick because I'm sure you'll be receiving a lot of love from Council here, but um, thank you both so much. And Ray, be it not verbal. I mean, you have said so much. I mean, just even opening up uh, your place uh, to house Firehouse 5. Now, of course, in the resolution, um, should uh, Firehouse 5, for any reason, move, um, it would still have that designation of Firehouse 5. It's just wherever the community is. Um, and, and you put in so much heart into it. Thank you. And, and if I'm in the car with you, I mean, you definitely have a lot to say, sir. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, Anyways, um, I just, uh, I think that the resolution, um, now I recognize that staff um, and, and uh, both of you have put in um, a lot of time into, into the resolution, um, but to me, I think it's just the easy part, right? So the tough part was um, recognizing the need, um, building the community and having, uh, like the resolution says, and have you beautifully laid out a place for retired firefighters, right? Um, not because they just, you know, don't have anywhere to go and they should have a place to congregate, but they have made real contributions to our community and continue to do so, right? Through their uh, sharing, uh, their passing down of knowledge um, as elders um, to our current firefighters. Um, and uh, there is uh, something, um, there are things that you see in that service, as I've learned, um, that uh, it's hard to relate to others with. And so it's really important to have to keep that sense of community. And then moreover, you don't have to do the historic preservation part, but you do. You know, we see some of the most beautiful engines um, in Firehouse 5, and you can even come down and take a ride on it. Um, and it's really lovely. And the photos that you see, I mean, I can't find that anywhere just looking on the archives. Um, and it, so it's just, uh, there, there's a lot there. And it's not just a just a, a group of older people hanging around.
around, but I like that too. Um, so, uh, thanks for, uh, giving us an opportunity to, to support you. And, um, and I guess I just say in closing is, uh, that when you care about people, um, you try to, I think, uh, pay attention to the things that they care about and they value. And so um, I think this is really a small token to say how much we care about Firehouse 5 and also our firefighters. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Councilmember Madrone. What I love about this is a part of your, um, the reason that you, you guys stay together is to tell the history of the Olympia Fire Department and having Station House 5 creates a really great opportunity to tell a story over and over and over again. Cause I can imagine people in the future saying, Oh, there's, there's a mistake here. It goes from straight from four to six, what's going on. And there's the opportunity to tell that story again. Um, and I'll just say that next time I, I do a ride along, I'd like to come to station house five. <laughs> it's a little slower. <laughs> uh, yeah. And just real quick, I forgot to introduce, I've got some of the guys who were brave enough to show up with us, uh, retired firefighters Mark Stewart, Steve Cooper, and Larry Smith. Oh my goodness. They ate double lunches, so they made it. Yes, yes. All right, I've got Councilmember Parsley followed by Councilmember Cooper. I can't imagine uh, the day when you have to let down and not go into work on something you're called to do. In the last few years, I've really gotten to know the firefighters, and I know this is a calling. Um, what you do, running into a fire when everybody else is running out, helping people when they're trapped or having a medical emergency, that's a true calling and going back every day. So all of a sudden, not being able to do that would be like an empty spot. So I'm very proud that we were able to do that, and I'm proud of Council Member Huen and your work to allow us to hang up that number like they do in the sports teams when there's somebody particularly important, you take that number out of the roster. And um, I'm very proud that we did that. And thank you, both, all three of you. All right, I've got uh, Council Member Cooper called by, followed by City Manager Jay Burney, and then we're gonna get a photo with all you guys. I love that you just compared Firehouse 5 to Larry Bird and Michael Jordan like that that's 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 a really good analogy I, I like that let's hang up the jersey and and keep the good work going and and learn the lessons and I think it's important I mean to recognize the work you're doing that you don't really talk about including keeping each other alive uh, which is, there's stories in that space that are really important and, and closely held in that place and even, you know, as the chair of the left one board, our law enforcement and firefighter, um, you know, health benefits that we provide to, to some of our firefighters, um, Steve Cooper is, sits on that board and represents firefighters. And just having Firehouse 5 has created a space for having conversations with the membership in a way that we didn't really have in the past. And mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great addition to the ongoing work of the city to take care of you all, too. And we're committed to that. And Excited to see where you go with it. All right, and finally, uh, Jay Burney, our city manager, has some comments. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate an opportunity to weigh in here. I, I want to thank the council for this honor that you're bestowing on Station 5, and, and I really want to thank the members of Station 5, um, all of them who have had significant careers at the City of Olympia and, and in other jurisdictions and other agencies, and I put their lives on the line uh, over and over again to make this community a better place. And um, although I've never been a firefighter, I've learned a lot about um, firefighters over the years of my career and the brotherhood that's created amongst that group. And I can't imagine what that feels like when you retire um, and to have something created uh, that they've created together to keep that brotherhood alive and uh, keep each other moving forward is incredible. So I wanna thank them for what they've created and also just again, thank them from the bottom of my heart for all that you've done for this community and continue to do for this community. So thank you. Yeah. There's some sisterhood in there too. I'm <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Let's get a photo real quick. And three months. You know, in the center, the spices. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and shift a little, just a little closer.
Pepper Jack and Hamburgers? Yes. Thanks, Lily. Thanks. 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 All right, we are going to move right along. That was a very special, special recognition time for all of us. Uh, now is the time of the evening that we receive comments from our community. Uh, we um, allocate two minutes per person. There's a if you're remote, there's a countdown clock on your screen, and if you're in um, the council chambers, there's a countdown clock over my right shoulder. Uh, there's you know several rules mostly that you can't speak to a um, public hearing that we've held uh, 45 days in the past or 45 days in the future so we can't entertain any comments regarding that as well as any uh, ballot measures or uh, candidates for office okay uh, so at this time I would like to uh, open up public comment uh, with our remote uh, person that signed up and that's uh, Leah Davis and it'll take a minute for Ms. Davis to um, move over in the she's traveling in the uh, in the web sphere here we go hello hello there can you hear me yes and is the countdown clock on the screen yes excellent you can start whenever all right, thank you. Uh, good evening, council members and Mayor Selby. My name is Leah Davis. I am a planner for Thurston County. I worked with city staff Joyce Phillips and Carrie Hornbein to complete the Olympia joint plan draft that is on your agenda tonight. Um, they uh, helped get it through the planning commission process and finishing up the draft. I want to thank Joyce and Carrie for their help their hard work, their patience throughout that process. And I also want to thank uh, the council for their consideration of the Olympia joint plan. Uh, county staff look forward to getting a recommendation from the city to forward to the board of county commissioners. This recommendation will help keep us on target to get the joint plan adopted before the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you. And that uh, is all that we had uh, signed up for remote testimony. Uh, next, we'll go to people that signed up this evening in chambers. We have one person, and I'd like to invite forward Maria Ruth. Good evening, Mayor Selby and City Council. I am the newly retired chair of the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee. Um, I'm sorry I missed the special recognition, um, but thank you um, for your letter, Mayor Salve, and your kind words for my service. Um, I'm here tonight to introduce you to the new chair, where is she? Alex, Alex Safik. Um, I wanted to um, read from her application um, to Parks. Um, and Rec Advisory Committee. Um, she's been on the committee just a year, and um, her application was so strong, and her interview was so strong. I feel so good about her now being our new chair. So in her application letter, she wrote that, as a postdoctoral research associate, my work involves addressing environmental justice and addressing systemic barriers to equitable access to public lands. I am passionate about the role of parks and outdoor recreation and its capacity to contribute to the overall well being of both individuals and communities at large. I would like to be of service to the community in which I live, downtown Olympia, and believe the Parks and Recreation Committee would provide a beautiful opportunity to do so. I'd like to offer my expertise in any capacity that the committee would find beneficial. So with that, I would like to introduce Alex, who has a few things to say. 
Hello, members of council. Thank you for having me here. And thank you, Maria, for a beautiful introduction. I just wanted to uh, present myself to you all and say that I'm very proud and excited to serve, continue to serve PRAC um, in this capacity. Excellent. Thank you. So that concludes public comment. Uh, any uh, comments from the dais? Uh, Councilmember Madrone? Uh, well, Lee, I'm really excited to talk about the joint plan later on this evening. Um, and Maria, thank you so much for all your service to the city. And Alex, uh, congratulations in your new position with PRAC. I'm really excited to see what you bring forward. Thank you so much. All right. Anyone else? I think the happiest day is when you get appointed to being chair. And your next happiest day is when you're like handing it off. To the <laughs> <laughs> You both look very happy. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I, I remember re interviewing uh, the caliber of people in our community that put their names forward to serve on our advisory committees and councils and commissions are just amazing. And uh, it's just an honor to get to work with you. So um, it's just another example of that. So thank you. Um, all right, so we're gonna, uh, that closes public comment. And we now move forward to uh, adopting our consent calendar items. I need a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Um, I have a poll, uh, one poll for staff comment, and I think I saw Ron in here, yes. And that is item four, um, of course now I. C. C, thank you. 4C, which is uh, approval of resolution adopting the Waste Resources Management Plan for 2023 through 2030. We had a briefing on this last week that you that you led us through, and um, so this is the night where we approve it. And so um, just wanted to recognize that and have you um, fill in any gaps I might have left open. Well, good evening, and thank you, Mayor Selby, members of council. This is Ron Jones, Senior Planner in the Waste Resources Utility Public Works Department. That is always a mouthful to get out. <laughs> so thank you. Um, yeah, so um, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words for this. Uh, we do have our Waste Resources Management Plan update um, on your consent calendar, a resolution to adopt. And we are excited to get this kind of through. Uh, it's a, you know, a two year long process, roughly. Um, it's been reviewed by the city's utility advisory committee, the land use and Envir environment committee. Uh, we've checked in with the Council of Neighborhood Associations, and it's an exciting time to get this, get this through. And I, I'll just kind of, uh, kind of do a quick run through of kind of what this plan does for our utility. We are a municipal collector. We're we're kind of rare in the state of Washington in that regard, as I I had mentioned during the briefing. So. So the plan goals and strategies and actions um, in the plan will guide the city's garbage recycling and organics collection and education outreach programs over the next seven to eight years. Uh, the plan does honor our prior commitments and builds upon our past accomplishments. And it was developed around, um, I'm, I have written here three themes, but really it's kind of each theme is sort of multiple. So uh, it's around the themes of climate and environmental goals, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and operational safety, efficiency, and financial sustainability. So as you mentioned, uh, Mayor Selby, uh, we briefed council on the plan last week on April 11th, and you opened a public hearing. We did not get any comments during that public hearing. We also had an open comment period back in, from mid-December to January, where we received one comment, and it was um, more of a general comment. So uh, the public seems to be in favor not hearing any um, opposition anyway. Uh, and so the plan, um, again, I mentioned it was reviewed by the um, UAC and the Land Use Environment Committee. It also went through the Estate Environmental Policy Act or it's SEPA review, that's an environmental review where we determination of non-significance was issued. And um, again, really this really, this work, this plan really guides our work for improving recycling and composting uh, our recycling and composting program outcomes, I should say, and reducing the amount and impact of waste in and on our community. So I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to say a few words and for council's support in this plan. Thank you. Thank you for that recap. Um, any other questions, comments, or polls? 
Thank you, Steph. All right, we've got a motion and a second to adopt tonight's consent calendar. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes. That takes us to tonight's public hearing, and that is item 5A. Get my ducks in a row here. Hiding. There it is. So item 5A is a public hearing to consider an ordinance declaring a continuing state of public health emergency related to houselessness. This is a first and final reading, so we will be um, entertaining a motion at the end of the hearing, at the close of the hearing. And we've got Rich Hoy, who is our assistant city director, assistant city manager. Yes, thank you, Mayor Selby, council members, good evening. Uh, again, for the record, I'm Rich Hoy, assistant city manager. And tonight we're holding a, a public hearing on an ordinance declaring a continuing state of public health emergency related to houselessness within our community. The council originally declared a public health emergency back in July of 2018, and council has subsequently extended that every six months uh, since that time. The sunset date on the ordinance was also extended by the council out to December 19th, 2024. Um, in response, as the council knows, the city has made really substantial investments and efforts uh, in homeless response outreach, public health sanitation support at encampments in our community, in emergency shelter housing, affordable housing, renter protections, and much more. All of that aimed at helping us address the public health emergency in our community. Uh, just this week, our homeless response team is helping coordinate a large uh, cleanup of garbage and waste at the encampment at Slater Kinney and, and I-5. Um, and work started on that today and will continue through the rest of the week. There's quite a bit of work there. Uh, and as the, the council knows, the city and our regional partners are working hard on emergency shelter housing for those residing in the Slater Kinney and the Wheeler Avenue encampments. A nearly 120 unit hotel is in Lacey is being converted into an enhanced shelter. That work is underway now. Uh, and very shortly, the, the city of Olympia will begin construction on a 50 unit tiny home village in East Olympia on Franz Anderson Road. Once those projects are ready in late spring and summer, we'll then be able to offer housing to those that are residing within those encampment areas. And, and after that, and we've transitioned folks to housing, the state of Washington, the Department of Transportation are gonna close those areas to, to further encampment. So some solutions are in the works and are actively coming uh, for those encampment areas. Uh, while I have the opportunity, I just really want to thank Darian Lightfoot, our Director of Housing and Homeless Response, and her team for all the efforts that they're doing. Uh, and yeah, they're really significant. And um, they have done a lot to implement the One Community Plan, which is really our blueprint for how we respond to, to this crisis within our community. And much more is planned to come. So at this time, before you open the public hearing, I'm happy to take any questions on the ordinance. Any questions? All right, thanks for that recap and also for uh, briefing us on what is happening with the the camp along Cedar Kinney that we all are hearing about and our other jurisdictions are hearing about as well. Um, I think that we do have a great plan in place and, and nothing happens quickly enough. And the sooner that we can find safe and, and warm places for those people to be, the better for everybody. So thanks for that update as well. Thank you. So at this time, I am going to open a public hearing to consider an ordinance declaring a continuing state of a public health emergency related to homelessness. I didn't have anybody sign up remotely. Uh, is there anyone in chambers this evening that would like to uh, make any comments for the record? Is there anyone here that would like to make comments? All right, I will close the hearing and um, ask uh, my mayor pro tem to make a motion. I would move that we approve on first and final reading the ordinance declaring a continuing state of public health emergency relating to human health and environmental conditions caused by increasing houselessness. Second. All favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you so much. It takes us to item. Selby. Yeah. Uh, can I? Sure. 
I just want to take a quick second and echo your thanks because I don't think in 2018 any of us thought when we said let's do a, 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 a mitigation site or a camping space that we would be where we are today. And it's because we brought on this amazing team of people that just keep blowing our minds like things that we don't think we can do we do again and again and again and and yeah. a lot of it is because of some of the flexibility from the ordinance we just readopted but mm -hmm. um also a lot of it's because of the leadership and the council keeping keeping the eye on the ball for that work so i just wanted to thank the community for bearing with us and thank the city for moving in the right direction and it also needs to be said that the state now is a willing partner, Good say. Uh, not just with their time, but their treasure, as they say. Um, so that increased our capacity to be able to do a lot of the um, programming and a lot of the housing that we that we are doing now. I can't remember partially. Um, I'm going to do a yes and for both the mayor and council member Cooper. This was my first year on council and it was eye opening. And I think right now we're standard on how to do this. We've got mitigation camps. Now we have tiny homes. Now we have just built supportive, permanently supportive wraparound service uh, facilities. I even heard in Portland, my sister commenting on how they're going to do like Olympia. So that's a bigger city. I, I'm very proud of our work. And one day we will be able to rescind this state of emergency, but we are not there. And wow, what a ride it's been. And thank you to the staff. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, item 6A, which is a uh, briefing on the cultural access ad hoc committee's recommendations for this new program, also um, referred to as Inspire Olympia. Very, very exciting to be at this, this juncture. Uh, I know that uh, in addition to the briefing this evening that we will be interviewing candidates for this new advisory committee uh, starting tomorrow night. And so they should be seated by uh, late spring. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to Mary Grace Godou, who is our Inspire Olympia program manager, uh, to, to walk us through this and also introduce some other people that have walked alongside her on this. So Thank you, Mayor Selby, and good evening, um, City Council. I'm Mary Grace Godou, Inspire Olympia Cultural Access Program Manager. Um, joining me in presenting this evening, I'm happy to introduce, we have a new staff member, Amelia Layton, and you'll hear from her in a few minutes. Amelia joined us in early March, and um, as Dr. Braff said earlier, you know, hiring staff is just, it's so great. <laughs> you know, it's more than the power of two now, it's exponential when you find somebody who's really right for the position, it makes all the difference in the world. And we have done that, so that's great. Also tonight, you'll hear from Mariella Luz, who is one of our ad hoc committee members. Um, so I'm gonna launch in, let's see, here we go, with a quick recap um, for everyone on what the Inspire Olympia program is. Um, cultural access is a measure to increase uh, public access to arts, culture, heritage, and uh, science experiences throughout our community, funded through one-tenth of one percent sales tax approved by voters a year ago in April. Cultural access funds can be used by eligible nonprofit organizations to strengthen and expand the programs that they produce for the public and lower barriers to participation through things like offering programs for free and at reduced costs. The program gives special focus to youth, underserved, and low-income populations, and works to provide uh, fair compensation to creatives, to artists and culture bearers and subject matter, subject matter experts. The fund will also pay for field trips for Olympia Public School children. I wanna note as we go through the presentation um, that when I refer to the arts, or cultural organizations, I'm talking about all four disciplines, arts, culture, heritage, and sciences, but that's a, a mouthful, so we're just gonna call it the arts or cultural organizations. Um, there we go. So um, just to recap a little further, um, voters approved cultural access in April last year, and the new tax went into effect in January. Um, but knowing that it would take some time to select and seat a permanent cultural access advisory board, and as Mayor Selby noted, they'll be seated, they're, they're, they're undergoing selection now, they'll be seated for May. But knowing that this, that was going to take some time, last October, 
City Council approved the creation of an ad hoc committee to get started on the considerable planning needed for the new program. Okay. Tonight, we're going to report to you on the work of that um, committee and offer a look ahead at program implementation. We assembled a small and mighty team in the Cultural Access Ad Hoc Committee. They're listed here on this slide, and I believe we have five of our committee members here tonight in the audience. Um, the, this committee, um, and I'll just read their names, Paul Knox, Tamar Krames, Janice Levine, Mariella Luz, Lee Little, Jean Mandeberg, and Anjali Silva. They met 10 times from November through March, and their report offers 50 recommendations in eight topic areas with background discussion and additional supporting information. We were supported in this work by consultants from the um, State Arts Commission, Miguel Guillen, who's a program manager there, and program specialist, Britt Madsen. They provided um, informed perspective and practical support. This was a dedicated, thoughtful, and productive group. And I just want to ask the members who are here this evening to stand quickly and be recognized. Maria. <laughs> so to the work. The committee's work began with orientation and discovery in which we reviewed the, in, the intent and the legal framework for cultural access. And then we looked at recent surveys, demographic and demographic, try that word again, demographic data. There we go. <laughs> Including US Census data for Thurston County and data from the Olympus School District. Um, and we looked at other community input, um, things like the creative district work that was going on last summer and the work of Olympia Strong and earlier survey work that we did before uh, the resolution to create the cultural access initiative. So they looked at all of that data that was part of that was their discovery. But then in addition to further inform their effort, the committee developed and fielded a survey of their own, which was live in January and February this year. Our thanks to the 60 plus community cultural organizations who took time to respond, sharing what they do, who they serve, their hopes and their challenges. One of the big takeaways from that survey came through in responses to open-ended questions about short and long-term goals. Responding organizations overwhelmingly echoed two themes that we've been hearing since the 2018 ARCH study. They need more or better space, and they want to hire more people. They want to grow. From piano tuners to marketing, they want staff, they need interns, and they, they want to contract for services. This need affirms the core intentions of cultural access to serve the community through the arts by strengthening the cultural sector. And we can expect that cultural access funding, um, at least in the first year or so, is likely to go directly to hiring people and increasing space to support creative work in the community. And this led the committee to focus on grants that serve these needs, which you'll hear about in their recommendations. The outcome of the committee's work is presented in the form of a recommendation, recommendations report that will be transmit, transmitted to the permanent advisory board as soon as that group is appointed. The committee's recommendations are organized under these headings, mission and goals, promoting equity, defining public benefit, demonstrating public benefit, eligibility, granting structure, evaluation and review, and program communications. We won't try to cover all this tonight, but we'll give you the highlights. Um, the recommendations focus primarily on the first leg of the journey, year one and year two, the first two cycles of, of program granting. Um, they include important recommendations about how we travel together in addition to where we plan to go together. For example, the committee emphasized that the program should start simple and grow and evolve with the community. They advocate for thoughtful data collection to set baselines and then support continuous improvement. They stated the importance of building trust and creating many pathways to participation. And they would like to see the city start by doing less and doing it very well and building the program from there. I'm going to introduce Mariella 
from the committee to speak to the mission and goals that the committee developed and also to the committee's emphasis on promoting equity. Mariella? Thanks everyone for having me tonight. So um, our mission statement we feel like is a starting point and the ad hoc committee assumes that it can and will evolve as the needs of the, with the needs of the mission of the program. We've intentionally placed equity at the top of our goals as, as it's integral to all of the work. The committee listed additional priorities that support these program goals and should be integrated into the program guidelines and criteria. To ensure that organizations make equity a priority in their publicly funded work and within the program that Olympia's Cultural Access Program Administration follows the city's commitment to practices that reduce inequities and earns trust through transparency and, and, sorry, and accountability. Sure. So this is our embracement to equity. <clears throat> we want to support and encourage new and emerging organizations, especially those by and for BIPOC and LGBTQ and other systemically marginalized groups. We will also want to support collaborative work among cultural organizations with a focus on those with interdisciplinary partnering support fair compensation for the work of artists, culture bearers, and environmental educators, with a focus on pre-K through, um, through grade five in public school cultural access programming to identify gaps in, enriched, in enrichment opportunities and funding for, for public school age group. Yep. Thank you, Mariella. Sorry. There we go. The committee talked extensively about how to provide support for cultural organizations in achieving the intended public benefits. This slide offers just a snapshot of those recommendations. They recommend that we define public benefit in terms of the program mission and goals that Marielle just shared. And these goals should inform applicant proposals and serve as the backbone of our evaluation and award process. For outreach, they recommend that we offer an array of options for people to seek and receive information, including working one-on-one, -on -one, webinars, and um, workshops. We'll want to direct those who are not directly immediately eligible to fiscal sponsorship options and toward partnerships with eligible organizations. We can facilitate matchmaking among groups and with individuals to offer additional pathways to participation. The committee recommends that applicants be asked to offer a two-year plan with goals to support uh, sound planning and to foster accountability. And the committee recommends following a continuous improvement model to regularly recalibrate the program as we collect data and experience. This will help us identify service gaps and address equity in overall program outcomes. <clears throat> Regarding eligibility, Keep it local. Because the fund is generated through an Olympia sales tax, the investment should stay local. But Olympia is, a geographically, is geographically small, and the committee recognized that limiting eligibility to organizations within the city limits would just be too exclusive. So the committee recommends defining eligibility by where the services are provided and to whom, rather than by the physical address of the provider. They recommend that we limit program eligibility to organizations who conduct a majority of their activities in the city of Olympia or who primarily serve Olympia residents or youth in the Olympia School District. Summarizing the recommendations on how to structure our grants, these are the highlights. That two-year funding cycle that I mentioned earlier is important because it provides organizations with some stability and reliability in their funding. To be clear, we will have an annual application cycle, but once an organization is approved in year one, they're on course then for two years of funding with opportunity for adjustments along the way and a simplified application like a checkpoint kind of for the year two cycle. No set-asides. There's an option in the enabling statute for communities to directly fund certain organizations if we develop criteria for doing so. This echoes programs in Denver and St. Louis 
where major organizations, there's actually five major institutions in each of those cities, from zoos to botanical gardens to you know, natural science museums. And those are funded right off the top. And then the remaining funds are competitively allocated to smaller organizations. Um, but those are larger programs in much larger communities. And the committee felt that, at least in the initial few years of our program, all applicants should compete for funding and compete this, complete the same base application, that this would help to set program baselines, contribute to, contribute to transparency, and build trust. This decision can be revisited later if there are good reasons to do so. The next bullet, do not try to distribute funding in 2023. The committee considered a few different early funding uh, strategies for this year, um, either through an early eligibility review or through a pilot application. But they concluded that any early funding process would require an expedited effort. It would distract staff and the community from preparing for the first full cycle of granting in 2024, and that these things together could, uh, could raise equity concerns given the tight time frame. Um, and I think it's the last bullet here that they recommend that we begin in 2024 by offering two core funding pathways, general operating grants. These are unrestricted funds that organizations can use to support their operations and service delivery and what we're calling CAPS, which is cultural access in public schools. And Amelia is gonna talk a little bit about those funding pathways. Thank you. Um, yeah, so starting with uh, just clear and regular communication of the eligibility, we want that to be live and available to everyone year round so that those smaller organizations can reach out and we can help support making them eligible if they're not. Um, and uh, along with that, having the guidelines and the application questions ready to go all the time so folks can take their time, can work on improving their applications for the following cycle. The, the sort of flow of it is up on the screen here. And so eligibility will be reviewed by program staff. If they are eligible, they can move on and kind of pick their funding stream. If they're not, then they can call on us and we can help connect them to a bigger organization, help them get ready to become ready for this funding. The GO grants or general operating, the two-year operating funding application will um, go alongside with the CAPS funding application. There's a little bit of coordination with the school district that needs to play into that. And I'll get into that in the next slide. That goes down to the panel review. Um, and the panel will then make recommendations for funding and then present it to y'all. Um, the city council will approve that. Contracts will be made. The public benefit will happen. And then grant reporting on the side of the organizations will happen where we can start to collect our data and then reflect on that process to continually improve it. Um, so as we mentioned, the programs that support students, teachers, and learning are a core goal of the program and um, there are a lot of complexities in bringing in a wave of fresh organizations into the school space. Um, uh, some of which are, it's essential to build trust with principals, educators, and families. The physical and emotional safety of the children, we wanna make sure these educators know how to, how to work with students of varying backgrounds and um, experiences. Awareness and training for program providers we think is essential vetting of program proposals, and ultimately avoid and minimizing the burden on teachers and school staff. Um, so those are things that we're looking into, which is why for the first year, because of this, the first year um, organizations are required to show prior success in school programming to receive CAPS funding for year one, while we then work to deepen um, the program carefully to assess the level of uh, coordination required before expanding that to new organizations who are just dipping their toe in the, in the youth work area. Um, however, any organization can receive funding to support field trips with the goal to eliminate the financial barriers of these experiences for Olympia Public School students in the first 
and following years. Um, another seemingly small but impactful element to this program is to make cultural access transportation funding readily available and easy to use on both sides for the teachers to request and for cultural organizations. So bring on the field trips. Thanks, Amelia. This is our last slide. And it is a timeline um, now through actually January, last January through um, next December, December 2024. Um, and we are in the second box up there, uh, top left, um, the second quarter of 2023. And the Cultural Access Advisory Board, that's the CAB, um, will begin their orientation in May. And they're going to go right to work to deal with some big questions that are still on the table, things like, the size and the scale and the number of grants, um, whether to require matching funds and how much and for what types of grants, uh, communications planning, um, branding and outreach, and reviewing and approving pro program guidelines and the application. Then um, in the summer, July, August, September, we will take this work hopefully and progress it through legal review the, uh, and then it'll come to the CLIPS, the uh, Community Livability and Public Safety Committee in July, and then back to you in August for another look. Um, assuming that all goes well, um, we uh, will be able to really bring this to the public for real in starting in September, October, November. The sooner the better, because there's a lot of public education and outreach to do to share the guidelines, to help people get ready to apply, to help them shape their proposals. Um, and then coming around the corner to January of 2024, we will open the application hopefully in mid to late January for, uh, for the public to, to begin to apply. The application process will take that entire first quarter of the year. Then uh, April, May, June, our uh, review process, our panel is, will be the, the advisory board. They will recommend awardees to city council for approval. And um, by July 1, we should have funding in the community at work. Um, and that will become kind of our rhythm that January, the first quarter is the application cycle. You know, the last quarter of the previous year is spent you know, doing public outreach and assessing the program. Um, the first quarter of the year will be the application. The spring is spent reviewing, um, and then summer we're in motion again. Um, we're eager to build on the great foundational work of the ad hoc committee, and we look forward to working with the new uh, permanent advisory committee as soon as they're seated. This has been a really high flyover tonight, um, and we're really happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mary Grace, and everybody else that's in supporting you. Uh, we are, you know, just thrilled to have it at this juncture, and uh, so much work so quickly that you were able to accomplish. So I'm going to open it up to any questions from the group or comments. I'll I'll go with. Oh, it's like everybody. So I'll start. Oh, I'll end with you. Um, Councilmember Huen? Um, not so much a question. Uh, just some uh, some comments of gratitude for the uh, the ad hoc committee members um, as they transition. Um, so uh, clearly, with even this, uh, this high-level overview, um, the ad hoc committee for cultural access has played really a critical role in founding of our cultural access program. Um, it's a really big time commitment for these volunteers. Um, and even through a really busy season with meetings, I understand it to be twice each month, uh, running right through the holiday season as well. Um, uh, from uh, what Mary Grace says, that the committee really jumped in and kept a really strong pace, um, even collectively volunteering over 650 hours of service. Um, so quite a lot. Uh, I think uh, going through the recommendations, we can really see that you put your heart into it. And so for that, we thank you. Um, 
This is a thoughtful and dedicated group of volunteers that has offered a program framework that is responsive to uh, the current needs of the community, um, also rooted in values that uh, come from uh, the heart and, and the values of the city of inclusion, trust, equity, community building, and a clear belief in the power of creativity. So um, for those ad hoc committee members uh, present and, and maybe present online, um, Paul, Tamar, Janice, Mariella, Lee, Jean, and Anjali. Um, on behalf of the Council's Community Livability and Public Safety Committee, I want to thank and applaud the members of the Haddock Committee for their work. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well said. I've got Councilmember Parshley. Thank you to the Ad Hoc Committee. I'm very excited about this program. Um, sort of twofold question. Grants, that's a real specialized thing to do. And some worthy grantees may not know the process. Did I hear education is going to be part of that? There's lots of head shaking. Thank you. Because uh, I watched that and I actually had to take a course in graduate school. It's quite that deal. Um, I was looking at the two takeaways from the surveys and not getting a lot of minority based answers. That probably will inform your equity, am I right? Um, so is there going to be more outreach, I'm assuming, to try to make sure? Because I agree with you, equity should be part of it um, and based on the program. So is it going to start with outreach to try to get more information on barriers and uh, making it attractive? Absolutely. Um, and that's one of the reasons we really want to leave lots of time um, we, we need, you know, a good three, four months to prepare the community to help people understand the application process. We, uh, one of the goals of the committee, um, or one of their strong recommendations is to make that process as simple as possible. Um, and then to communicate about it in as many ways as we can. Um, and we will work with our city communications department and others. Um, we've already got uh, Toby Hillmeyer and Olivia Sal Salazar Debro on our team to help us to 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 reach out in in as many ways as we can to every every end of the community. You got some good rock stars. I just sure. want to thank the ad hoc committee again and thank you for this process. And I think starting simple and doing it well is a fabulous approach. So thank you very much. All right, Mayor Pro Tem Gilman. Thank you. It's, um, I, I, I think this is an amazing document for a new committee to begin work mm -hmm. with. It's um, a lot of work. I have two areas where I have wonderings or I, I feel some tensions. Um, one is about the keep it local that I, I both totally understand wanting to spend the money in our community. And I also know that um, people I interact with every day aren't really clear where the borders of Olympia are. And, and I think in particular about the DEI goals and that we have some strong organizations that don't have an Olympia address or that serve people across the north part of Thurston County. Um, so just figuring out how to balance that prioritizing uh, direct benefit to Olympia but also recognizing how porous our boundaries are and, um, and just, just striking that balance is interesting to me. And then the other issue is the, the, the cultural access program in schools proposal is pretty well fleshed out. And my, my gut from having tried to create both visiting artists and field trips is that it has to be co-created with the school staff, the, the whole proposal. So considering these priorities, but being open to what the schools think they can really implement um, and knowing um, luckily that the legislation allows transportation to be a, a good chunk of this funding because that was the bugaboo in my experience was securing transportation. Even if the event was free and the artists were paid for, um, uh, both administratively and money-wise, getting them there. Um, and and my, my one other school thing that was niggling me was to think about the annual cycle of the funding, that if it's granted in July, that's probably too late for fall quarter events. And so either having the money carry on beyond 12 months so that people could 
offer in June, you know, plan for a September or October event. Um, anyhow, that's, those are just a, a couple of reasons that I, I think it'll be really important to be open to the school districts, um, their co-creation of that, that program. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, we have been meeting regularly with the Olympic School District, and it's been great. They've given us time and attention um, whenever we needed it, pretty much. Um, we have been working with Inger, uh, Inger Owen, um, who is the current chief academic officer, and she has staff kind of dedicated to, to working with us. We also had the tremendous benefit of having Tamar Krames on our ad hoc committee. Mm -hmm. Tamar is, with, is also with the Arts Commission, and she does the um, arts in the schools statewide. Mm -hmm. uh, and she came to a couple of meetings over the summer um, over the, I'm sorry, over the winter with the Olympia School District, District and her input really helped to shape the program proposal as it sits today. We will continue to work with the school district very closely on it. <coughs> Thank you. All right, uh, next I have Councilmember Payne. Yes, hi, Mary Grace, it's good to see you. Um, one of the things that I was gonna mention uh, was more of just a comment, which is it's really interesting to see this really lengthy timeline <laughs> of all this work. Um, and it's really exciting to think about uh, in the next seven years or so on what this program is gonna turn into in this community. It's exciting to think about what it, the potential it has to be especially with, um, I really appreciate the focus uh, prioritizing equity, um, and I appreciate the service of the ad hoc committee. It's very clear that that is a priority for you all, and I'm hoping that that's something that our, our new committee will take on, um, and you're leading the way in that, so I appreciate that, and thank you. Um, the other thing I noticed, too, is um, in your timeline, it looks like you'll start uh, public outreach right around the fall time, so that's uh, it, what comes to mind for me is the perfect timing for fall art, arts walk, mm -hmm. uh, which would be a great time to really get out there in the community and let folks know about what this is and, uh, and uh, what's to come uh, and how they can participate. Um, and actually, that, that actually does bring a question to me, um, which is that um, although this can be sort of complicated, uh, what's the plan in terms for um, communicating this to uh, young adults or re recipients of this um, who will uh, benefit from, from this program. So what's the plan to communicate to them what this is? We have a lot of work to do in communication planning. I mean, it's it's a big area that we have honestly not gotten into the details of yet beyond to think, kind of map it out. Mm -hmm. um, we know we need to do a kind of a, a branding exercise with the incoming committee, and we know that that fall time period is going to be critical. Mm -hmm. um, we also hope that there'll be a lot of word of mouth on this. Mm -hmm. So, all right, wonderful. And I'm still confused. Did you have something? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm growing. laughs> um, I'll, well, I'll just echo the appreciation to the ad hoc committee um, and the report that you all provided was just so thorough and it showed the level of passion and dedication that you are offering to the city and to this program. So mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and I also appreciate the, the, go slow and do it right mm -hmm. uh, approach, uh, not trying to rush to get things out the door, but instead being just more thoughtful, considerate, trying to get it right the first time, though we know continuous improvement is part of the plan. Um, I actually, oh, and Amelia, uh, welcome. I don't know when you started, but this is the first time I've seen you, so. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, welcome. Uh, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, and I'm glad that Mary Grace has your support. Um, I, I actually wanted to speak to the eligibility required. I don't, I don't have that same tension that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Gilman does. I actually appreciated how the eligibility was set up because uh, it doesn't require that an organization be located in Olympia, just that the activity, the event, the, the what, whatever's being funded takes place here. And I doubt they're going to be carding people to make sure that they live in Olympia to participate. <laughs> so... Um, uh, but I, but I actually appreciate that approach because you know Mary Grace, one of the things that you led with is that we don't have enough space for organizations uh, and for and and so um, so that that made a lot of sense to me um, and. Um, 
I also appreciate the level of technical assistance that you're willing to offer to the community to help people apply, to figure out how to be eligible, to, you know, to know, to, to really, uh, uh, understand how they can access uh, these funds, um, and I do have a I do have a question. Um, so I know the the partnership with the school program is with the Olympia School District, and I mean this actually does get a little bit to the tension that Mayor Pro Tem Gilman was talking about in terms of eligibility. We do have some Olympia students that go to North Thurston in part of the city, and I'm just curious if that's been talked about at all in terms of um, you know. Uh, in any kind of inclusion there, or if it, if you've talked about it at all, a little bit, yeah. And um, the the short answer is that the program can only provide services in Olympia School District schools. So in school opportunities for youth are going to happen in Olympia School District schools, but youth who go to other schools outside of the Olympia School District, they still live here in Olympia and they can access any programs that are offered for Olympia youth outside of the school day or maybe even after school. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm glad I'm glad you guys thought yeah. about that and yeah. gave it consideration. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right, next I have Councilmember Cooper. Thank you, Mayor Silby. And I also want to echo the <clears throat> the thanks to the committee. You know, the so sometimes when you read an RCW, you're like, are they trying to confuse you on purpose? And this was one of those, yep. right? Like when you read through the sections and 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 the the plan that has been presented does an excellent job bringing that intent statement in the legislative documents to life, I think. And in particular, having the central focus on on equity. Um, the legislature went out of its way to talk about the recession and staff and infrastructure, and in the middle of that was a was accessed by vulnerable populations. And so, uh, I feel like that that is just the most beautiful piece of this. Like that that really came to life. Um, I also love the two year planning process for for the applicants. I think in, in my in my mind, and I would encourage thinking around two year. Um, cycles like so you actually have a contract that's two years mm -hmm. um, I would take the word grant out of everything and talk about performance-based contracts for delivering services that meet the needs of the city's cultural access plan which you have almost all identified in the bullets of your um, public benefit section and, and to me you know I, I, I really like the go slow now because we'll get the organic product um, I hope that it does lead to having a city plan that we're, that's informed by this work that we're marching toward mm -hmm. toward together. Um, and I know there's a lot of complexity to that, so I'm not I'm not really asking for that now. Um, some actually not sometimes all the time. Government and private philanthropy are guilty of keeping the institution that keeps access from people closed while saying we want you inside. Mm -hmm. And and so the opportunity to be organic and go slow here provides a space for Olympia to reinvent what that looks like. And I, I really appreciate one of the bullets about having a first payment for performance mm -hmm. early. I mean, I've done a lot of state and federal and, and local contracting over the years. And it's like, where do you come up with the cash flow to start this thing, right? You're small. And and so I, I also want would love to see the contracts all be like that. So you turn in your report, you get paid instead of Here's the nickel and dime 30 invoices that have to go together to be reimbursed to create this fu this funding package. So I um, just want to add that con that thought to that those that thinking. Um, sorry, I have a handful. I like it a lot and I took a lot of notes. So the the other one is um, when we contract, we need to make sure that the contracting organizations are meeting our climate and equity goals. And I think the equity part is really spelled out, you know, but I also think that there's um, an importance, we're talking about a whole bunch of diesel transportation right now. And so do we know that the contractor that'll be providing that has a plan to reduce, you know, carbon emissions while hauling people all over the community? And we have yet to see what the school district is writing around their own climate planning, right? And so I think that's an important conversation, not that we have to go all in on day one, but it's really important to me. Um, I'm glad that we're 
delaying a year because one thing that I also didn't see here that we that the committee should think about is establishing a reserve for a rainy day. Uh, we know from the what we've just been through that we may need to see, save organizations in a really hard time. And so the fact that we are a little bit behind, I think, provides an opportunity for that and maybe that future planning uh, if we if we decide to go there. Um, one thought that came up when, when Councilor Madrone was speaking is, you know, there's a whole K through eight school district that goes to Capitol High School and, you know, the, so in Griffin. Yeah. And, and we need to think about how to make sure those kids aren't behind in the arts when they come to Capitol High School. So I don't know if that's necessarily the city art role, but it's certainly something that the committee should wrestle with a little bit. And maybe there's other ways to bring the Griffin kids up to speed before they get to high school. Um, and then my last comment is just, you know, would, would appreciate a little bit more conversation about the importance of the capital infrastructure that's existing in our community that lends to arts and culture, um, whether it's the waterfront or our buildings or the Olympia Center. Uh, so many are providing the, the limited existing access. And while I, f I read it between the lines in this report, I don't see that called out. And I'm not saying call out a grant fund, just emphasis in the goals that that's important. Okay. But overall, those are all really minor things and, and actually a lot of accolades to the work and the writing that was done. So thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. Those were insightful. No, that's all right. This, this is what this is about, right? And this is such a big new program for us. And so it, it's worthy of a lot of um, thought and feedback. Um, I just wanna speak to a couple things that I heard. Um, the local focus, yes, that was really discussed quite um, at, at length, uh, even before it went to the ballot. Um, and I wanna point out that the legislature just passed um, a new law that uh, cultural access programs are now council manic, and that means that you do not have to go to the ballot every seven years. It can just be a simple vote of a majority of a council or a county commission to institute a, a new program in their communities. So um, when I think about North Thurston and I think about Tumwater and I think about um, the county, uh, they just need a majority of the votes to create this own program their own program around cultural access. Um, so I'll definitely be talking to my electeds in neighboring constituencies to um, about that because um, they all were like, well, we, we should we should do something like this. And it's like, well, yeah, you can now. <laughs> so um, that I also want to talk about um, one of the you know things we heard back in 2018 around the arch um, outreach and be well before that the Olympia Art Space Alliance all the work that they did around uh, spaces for for creatives to have um, available to them and the and the dearth there are or there was you know now we have an armory which is 50,000 square feet and it's kind of empty right now. So um, I'm really, really excited about the potential for the nexus between people getting um, access to the space there through um, through this program. You know, it can't directly benefit the city, but uh, it can directly benefit nonprofits that want to work in uh, spaces such as the Armory. Um, talking about, yeah, the local folks focus, um, I remember discussing that, you know, it, the, Olympia has a lot around you know, the arts and cultures and history and science. But we don't have everything. And so if there's something that there's, a, you know, that an experience that students can't find in Olympia, then it, they can apply for a field trip to, you know, the Lacey Makerspace or some other kind of um, experience, maybe even up in Seattle that, you know, like a tour that's up there that um, at one of their museums that we can't bring down here. So um, there is flexibility as long as it benefits primarily the people within the Olympia School District um, borders. So I think that's all I had. I just wanted to also just, oh, here we are. Um, you just let it be known that the council, it is on our shoulders, mm -hmm. right? We have to approve the final um, outline. Um, if there is going to be someday a decision to do um, an allocation, a st more of a structured allocation, um, like they do in Denver. You know, we have that that ability if we decide at some point that we want to have a set aside for certain organizations. Um, so that's you know, it's 
flexible that way. And then even all the funding decisions from the advisory committee come through us too. Right. So we get a lot of touches and angles. So, yeah. all right, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for extended grace and thanks to everybody. All right, we're on to item 6B tonight, and that is a 6B does need a motion. So uh, this is a presentation of the Olympia Joint Plan, which is part of the comprehensive plan for the urban growth area. And it's uh, been a joint partnership with the city of Olympia and Thurston County. They've been working together to adopt a joint comp plan for the unincorporated areas. And to walk us through that is Joyce Phillips, who's a principal planner in our community planning and development department. Welcome, Joyce. Hey, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Selby and council members. Um, I'm excited here to be here tonight to talk with you about the Olympia Joint Plan. But before I really get started, I, I, I want to pause and thank Thurston County staff, especially Leah Davis, who you heard from earlier this evening. Um, she was professional and kind and personable, but without her persistence in getting to this point, we wouldn't be here tonight. So thank you to Leah. And I also want to thank Carrie Hornbein um, for her work in getting us through the public hearing and the deliberations process before she retired in February. So um, I'm kind of the closer, but I can't take credit for the work. <laughs> so thank you for that. So what is a joint plan? So the joint plan is the comprehensive plan for the urban growth area or UGA, which I'm sure I'll say several times this evening. And it really sets forth the goals and policies that will help guide future growth through our zoning and development standards in the urban growth area. So the city and county strive to have consistent standards for the UGA so that it will help provide a smooth transition as these unincorporated urban lands eventually become part of the city. So when you think about the city of Olympia's comprehensive plan, that's what the joint plan would essentially be for the urban growth area, which you can see highlighted in yellow on this map on the screen. So this is really the first update of the joint plan since the city of Olympia completed its major rewrite of its comprehensive plan in 2014. In the previous joint plan, there was an asterisk next to the goals or policies that the county was adopting for the urban growth area. But this time around, um, the city asked to also capture the text in each of the chapters um, to, so that we have a more complete and robust plan. And I don't know about you guys, but I think the text in each of our chapters is really valuable and it provides a lot of context. So we wanted to capture that for the, the UGA as well. County and city staff have been working to ensure that the plan is similar to the city's plan, but that it's also more specific to the fact that it's the county jurisdiction and the decision-making authority remains with the county um, until such a time as the properties um, within the UGA are annexed. In order to facilitate joint review of the joint plan, I'm gonna see how many times I can get the word joint in this, this paragraph here, but the, the county and the city planning commissions did hold joint meetings on the joint plan. There were two briefings in October, and then we held a public hearing in November. And then in order to complete de deliberations and, and get to that recommendation stage, an additional joint meeting was held in January. I think I'm up to five. Um, so although it wasn't required, the planning commissions did reach a shared recommendation after making a few minor modifications to the plan. So just to kind of highlight the changes, um, they included some modified language around agriculture in the UGA, as well as planning for growth within the urban growth areas. Um, there was also some language that was updated to be more specific to the county and then also references to transportation projects that were planned when we adopted our plan in 2014 but um, have since been constructed and so we referenced the fact that they were built. The Land Use and Environment Committee did consider the Planning Commission's recommendation and offered its support for the um, county adopting the joint plan. The, the committee did ask for a few minor changes, um, primarily around three topics. Updating the name of Squawks and Park, which used to be Priest Point Park in the plan. 
clarifying a transfer of development rights policy pertained to private property and um, continuing to work cooperatively on the implementation of rather than the development of a climate mitigation plan. A draft letter um, to support the county commissioners in adopting this plan has been prepared and is attached to your packet for your review. Um, and it does include these three requests, as well as encouragement for um, the county to continue the implementation after they adopt the um, joint plan to follow that up by adopting um, updated development regulations for the urban growth area as well. I do have a draft motion for your consideration. Um, the recommendation is to accept the Land Use and Environment Committee's recommendation to request the three minor changes prior to adoption, um, which is based on the recommendation from the Joint Planning Commissions, and to authorize the mayor to sign the letter of support that we would then send to the Thurston County Board of County Commissioners. So that's all I have this evening. I'm happy to try to answer any questions or um, any of the history on the project. Wonderful. I've got a question from Councilmember Payne. Yes. Hi, Joyce. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the staff report has something in here that I was just wondering if maybe you could help uh, answer. Um, it says that the plan has a recommendation that has a proposal to remove the requirement for a grocery store yes. um, in the community-oriented shopping center zoning district. And I was just wondering why that is. Great question. And I did not even bring that up. So um, when the proposal was considered, there was a request to redesignate the a portion of the Glenmore Village planned unit development, which is sort of what we would consider a, a, like a village center in, in the city of Olympia. Um, it's a mixed use development and the residential portion has been constructed. Um, there are some, some multifamily and commercial aspects that have not been built yet. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the requirements within that zoning district that implements the master plan um, is the requirement to build a grocery store. And that is shown on the approved site plan. Um, when you look at the zoning, there's a requirement to build a grocery store. And so rather than rezoning the um, property, we suggested just making the requirement for a grocery store be an allowed use, but not a required use. And both planning commissions agreed to that as well. And that is part of the prop Glen if you're not familiar with it it is on the south side of Yelm Highway near Rich Road mm -hmm. that property there and so there are um, several grocery stores in that area and it's not likely that an, an additional grocery store would be built there okay thank you yeah thank you for the question anyone else um Council Member Cooper yeah, thank you Mayor Selby I I appreciate the the work and I just wanted to bring forward one piece of conversation from the land use committee which was as much about this process as the actual work output um having been here when we passed the comp plan in 2014 um you know there were pluses and minuses to being slower that you know to kind of going as slow as we did a lot of the equity updates we did to the comp plan a couple of years ago ended up in this so that you know so that part is is is, a, is an advantage um but it's also been quite some time and and i think so one of the things that i asked of the city manager is and he's going to just check in and, and and let us know what it looks like is that we can reach out to the county and ask for a way to d redesign this process so that when we are doing our next comp plan update we're moving in parallel or we're ready to go right away after so that um, we can cut, cut that timeline down so but otherwise it's great work and um, i'm happy to support a motion great i've got councilmember madrone yeah, I was actually going to make the same comment that Jim just did in terms of like all the work that we put into updating our comp plan a couple of years ago to include uh, equity uh, and also, you know, the land acknowledgement from the tribe that we included in our comprehensive plan because we did that and because this joint plan took so long, um, it, it, it's incorporated into there. And I think that's really cool. Um, and so I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion unless it looks like Lisa might have a question. It's more of a clarification that land use might be able to help me with. Um, and I've been rereading, um, gosh, uh, on the letter page to the Board of County Commissioners. Is um, number two, because 
the land that Squaxin Park's on is special to the, the Nisqually, Quinault, Puyallup, Chehalis, Squamish, and Duwamish. Is that why we're listing them all as part of the parkland? I just need clarification if that's the case, which makes sense because a gathering place. It says the land upon which this park sits has been used for generations. Is it just because this is a special place for all of these tribes? Yeah, that 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 wasn't something that was specifically discussed by the committee. So I guess I guess it's more a question for Joyce, who I assume you drafted the the letter. Yes, and actually I believe I took that language from the city's web page okay. for the for the park. I just for the renaming ceremony after when we renamed it and everything. It, I I'm just trying to make sure I'm clear. Uh, I, if we're good with the letter as it's written, yeah, it has then... my name on it. So I... uh. yeah, I, I'm just. I, I guess my question, Lisa, is like, are you asking for a change to the letter? No, I'm just trying to make sure because you know the, the 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 this is. I'm just trying to make sure that this is appropriate. I guess is where I'm at. And if this is appropriate, I'm good. I I don't like know consistent with what we have on our website. And... Mayor. Yes. Uh, for just for my own personal benefit, I, I want to make sure you're not reading that second half of the sentence as a modification. It's just the context for changing the name from Priest Point to Squawkson. Mm. Yeah, we're we're not that yeah. that, that sentence not going to be in the plan. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's what I needed to hear. That's all I needed to hear. Yeah. The the only change to the plan that we're recommending is that. Wherever it says Priest Point Park, which is in exactly two places in the plan, um, we, we ask that they change it to Squaxin Park. That's all. Thank you. Um, but it would be good to get some clarification on this on this language that's on our website and understand where that came from. Because I know there's a lot of collaboration with Squaxin and all those materials. So, um, yeah. Okay. With all that, I will move to accept the Land Use and Environment Committee recommendation and authorize Mayor Selby to sign a letter of support requesting three minor changes to the Olympia Joint Plan. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you, Joyce, you. so Thank much. You. All right, that takes us to the end of our business meeting. Uh, time for council reports. Uh, I've got a mayor report, brief one. Uh, just want to remind people that next week we will not be meeting on Tuesday night. It's an election day. So we've moved our um, meeting to Monday. It is a study session, so we will not be um, taking public comment next Monday. Uh, and remember to vote. Uh, next, I have uh, kind of harking back to last week, talking about this uh, TRPC, Thurston Regional Planning Council, uh, process around the uh, setting up an urban growth management subcommittee of to look at zoning around uh, Grand Mound area. And uh, after kind of pitching it out here last week and then talking with um, our chair of the TRPC, which our city member, are you chair? Vice chair. Vice chair of TRPC. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Gilman has agreed to serve on this committee going forward. And then uh, our chair of land use, uh, Council Member Madrone, has agreed to be the, um, the backup. If you can not, you know, perform your duties. So. First runner up. Uh, so everyone okay with that? Just consensus? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. I will go to council member uh, Cooper. Thank you, Mayor Selby. One, just want a couple of updates from the clean air agency. So, um, recovering from our conversation last week, I wanted to let folks know that on the clean air agency website, there are safe, and uh, healthy fire building techniques. So if anybody was looking for that uh, instruction, uh, that's a good place to start. I also wanted to clarify a comment I made in real in response to Councilmember Parsley's question about methane and composting. Um, the closed system that I described is actually open all the way on the sides. Um, it's it actually the the composting system that we. Um, rely on it is uh, uses a lot of oxygen and it's constantly churned and that results in carbon but not methane so that that distinction between the landfill methane and my mistake to correct um, at the clean air agency we also uh, the board decided to move ahead with uh, implementing our salary survey results uh, and so we're going to be 
uh, re readjusting all of the um, steps in the ORCA salary system to bring us into the 50th percentile with the comparisons that we made. Um, and that also includes eliminating the bottom range because it wasn't a living wage for anybody in our community. And so uh, a couple of staff members will get adjusted that have been there for a long time and should have been making more. Uh, it's the second salary survey that we've done in the time that I've been at the Clear, Clean Air Agency. And I'm excited to see what comes from the city one because it's a really good equity tool to keep that conversation going. And uh, then we will work towards a the draft current draft budget for the Clean Air Agency, which, which has some impact on the city, uh, involves a 4% um, cost of living adjustment for the staff uh, and about a 6.2% increase in the fees based on our workload analysis. So that'll be the increase in our uh, city assessment for the coming year, so if it passes, which I, it's draft at the moment. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Council Member Cooper? All right, Council Member Quinn. I have no reports. Oh, sorry. I have no reports per se. Um, just a good opportunity to uh, heads up for uh, the mayor and council member Payne as we get ready for tomorrow night and the night after of in-person interviews. Um, uh, Kelly had sent over the uh, interview questions, and um, uh, so... I have some thoughts on that. And uh, I'm going to circle uh, tonight. I'll send you all an email um, of uh, some suggestions for interview questions. And so please take the time to review them and then uh, be ready to uh, go over them and then possibly add your own thoughts as well uh, um, in the moment we have together before we interview folks. So thanks. Thank you. Councilmember uh, Parsley. I have only one report, which is the Lock Clean Water Alliance, and we passed with actually very little fanfare our master plan that goes to 2050, which is actually a 10-year project, um, and that, uh, you know, it gets us to a point where we're going to actually double down on the Bud Inlet and Martin Way Reclaim Water, which means we are going to start surplusing quite a bit of land that we had decided if we couldn't put into Bud Inlet, um, we were going to have to put the water, the wastewater, into recharge plant ponds throughout the county. And so this is going to make us relook at that and look at our land. We will keep some in a straight shot line um, away from the plant just in case something doesn't go right with the preferred EIS and we get squeezed. But at this point, we're going to be pushing for that. And we actually looked in the 2050 plan for what would it take to make potable water and class A biosolids, which could be used in Thurston County for gardens and so forth, because currently we're taking our class B uh, biosolids out to the wheat farms in eastern Washington, which is actually going under a very large uh, study to and each each water treatment plant has their own acreage and they're following what they're finding in the soil, in the wheat, and it's gonna be quite the outcome. We're going in September to see some of the results of that. Um, we also had an interesting discussion on something, I don't know if the city started to look at, but we are actually buying equipment for a project that's not expected to start for a year because it's gonna take us a year to get the equipment. So we're actually purchasing the equipment before we get the RFP for the contractor um, because there's such a long lag time. And then lastly, we heard about um, the couple of the awards we won, including the Apple Award and a wellness program award for safety. And they showed us videos of the plant putting an egg drop uh, contest together from 40 feet and the engineers did not win. It was actually the front staff. But it was fun, and they're rubby, rubber ducky races, and they have actually won quite a bit of awards in the across the state for improving work culture. All right, thank you for that report. Uh, any questions for Council Member Partially? All right, Mayor Pro Tem Gilman. Thank you, Mayor Selby. No report this evening. Council Member Payne. Ditto. No report this evening. Right. Councilmember Madrome. Nothing to report. All right. City Manager Jay Burney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Two items. One, when I was in the fifth grade, we had an egg drop competition from a helicopter, and my team's egg did not break on that <laughs> helicopter. 
you want to learn more, I'll talk to me later. <laughs> uh, my, my second item to report is um, the mayor mentioned earlier about the Armory site. And last week was a, another really great milestone moving forward with the Armory. We had our first Armory partner workshop. Uh, where we invited community organizations to come and learn more from our park staff and our new building man, uh, Armory building manager about the space, about the Armory Creative Campus concept for them to collaborate together. Um, and we had 50 different community organizations show up to participate. So there is a lot of excitement about that space, a lot of need in the community, uh, which we all knew. And so I just want to report that out as a really great um, next step, and there'll be more to follow from there. They gather a lot of information about who is interested in that space and kind of what that looks like. And so that's going to really help um, the city kind of determine next steps. So just want to report that out. That's awesome timing. And I'm sure that also provided an opportunity for people to meet each other that are in these areas. And so potential partnerships could be formed over this kind of um, interaction. So that's really, really exciting and timely for our cultural access program. All right, any questions for our city manager? All right, with there being no further business before the Olympia City Council, we're adjourned.